Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Wu, I'm the lead designer of a game called Habo. So today we'll be going over uh, what is Habo uh, and our sister, uh, sister game, Hotel Hideaway. Uh, we'll be looking at the global impact that games are making on the market, uh, including regional market distribution and as well as like how is it distributed through uh, various devices. Uh, we'll be also looking at the diversity um, that it brings and of course it's going to be like a kind of experience about how I kind of started off uh, in, in the field and then some tips and tricks about how to get a better head start um, in your journey. So who is Solarke? Solarke is a social entertainment company. Uh, currently we're making two games. Uh, you have Habo on the left there is a pixel, uh, 2D pixel art style game. And then you have Hotel Hideaway that is more uh, 3D style based. They are both MMOs, so that stands for Massively Multiplayer Online, and that means just lots of people getting together and able to kind of simultaneously um, play the game together. Um, so what can you do in the game? Well, you can personalize your avatar, uh, you can build things, so build rooms with various furniture pieces, and you can, at the core of it, make friends and chat online. So let's look at some numbers. So what's it, um, what was it all about? So we have 800,000 monthly registered users coming in every month. Uh, we have 200,000 <coughs> new users um, coming in and that is coming in in a kind of organic rate. What does that mean? It means that um, it's not uh, kind of, we're not, it's not based on paid um, marketing strategies. So this is all kind of new people coming in. Roughly, it's kind of like uh, people coming in to fill in the Wembley Stadium, uh, two of them with some kind of leftover on the outside still queuing up. Uh, so that's, that's the scale of that. And then um, there's 310 million accounts and uh, still counting. Uh, we have 151 uh, identities and it's supported by well, 12,000 virtual goods that we make on a seasonal basis. So there are similarities between the two games, but uh, they target very different audiences. Uh, Habo is a 13 plus game, and Hotel Hideaway is a 17 plus game. So that gives us a kind of more, um, um, more ability to kind of target more wider audiences. So why is it doing so well after all these years? Um, Habo is kind of entering its 19th birthday this year, so pretty old for a game. But, uh, um, well, we have to look at the uh, game's mar like market value right at the, the moment. So if you look at the 2017 report, the year for that is $116 billion um, in market value. That's a 10.7 growth from 2006. Um, if you were to kind of break it down where they are kind of distributed, you have uh, mobile at 50.4 um, 50 billion dollars, uh, you have console at 33.3 billion, and PC gaming at 32.3 billion. Now you look at the next year, uh, you see the, the, the kind of uh, value soaring up to 135 billion, um, and that's a 10.9% growth rate. And then at the bottom here, you have 63.2 billion for the mobile, uh, uh, sorry, 38.3 billion for console, and 33.4 billion so, uh, for PC gaming. So you can see they're all growing. PC gaming is not growing as much, but it's still a significant amount at about 1 billion. So what does it look like for the years to come? Um, you might have noticed that there's some number changes going on here. So in the previous slide, in 2017, um, the market worth was 116. Uh, this is the latest update of um, 2018 in April. Um, they did that to 121.7 uh, billion. So uh, they adjusted that accordingly and it's actually, they were being quite lenient about what they were forecasting. Um, 
So as you can see, if it was at a steady rate of around about 10% uh, every year, by 2021, the games camp market would be worth 180 billion. Um, you might notice that these different segments on each year, um, that's the mobile, PC and console breakdown. And if you look at the comparison between the two, you can see that the mobile um, is kind of growing exponentially, uh, whereas the console and PC is at a kind of steady rate. Uh, but we will go be going back to that again uh, in, in the later slide. So what does 180 billion pound, or 80 billion dollars, sorry, um, mean in, well, if you look at it, if you look at this graph here, um, you can see that the games industry is actually uh, three and a half times bigger than the film industry and seven times bigger than the music industry. Um, it's uh, quite, <laughs> quite a comparison, uh, but uh, it's exciting times to be in games. So let's take a look at the market share per region. Uh, what does it look like on a global scale? So where's all that money kind of going to? Um, you can see that the Asia Pacific regions is taking up more than 52%, most likely backed up by China and the mass amount of citizens that are living there. Um, you have Europe, Middle East and Africa, and if combined with Latin America, they make up about a quarter of the remaining half. And then lastly, you have North America making up 23%. So you might be thinking, okay, so Latin America, 4%, you know, it's not, not that significant. But if you look at the year-on-year uh, -year growth, that's 13.5% uh, uh, higher. Um, and that, what does that mean? That means that Latin America is growing at a very, very fast rate. And that matches up with um, our Habo analytics, um, our, our data that we see back from users. Um, Habo is translated into nine different languages, um, and if you can, and it's available to 150 countries worldwide. And if you see the breakdown of share of users, you can see Brazil is up there at 37 percent. Um, that is more than five percent bigger than the running up, so Turkey, Mexico, and the United States. So if you were to look per country, um, so this is roughly what is kind of describing the uh, previous graph for the 52% of um, Asia Pacific, you see China up there, and the total revenue that they're generating is 34 um, billion. And if you look at the popular or population, it's 1.4 billion people. And if you look at the internet population, that's 850 million people. And if you were to do some calculations between that, you can estimate that about 61% of citizens pay and play for games. Um, and if you take a look at the second one up, you have United States, they're at 31 billion. Um, they have significantly less people, so 327 million, but they are more connected to the internet. More of them have, have access to it. That's 265 million. So through those calculations, uh, USA, there is about 81 people that are considered gamers or pay and play for games. Um, so that kind of balances both of these countries off. Um, between them, there's $3 billion. You might think to yourself, wow, that's a lot. But then if you look at the third runner-up, Japan, that's a significant difference of $14 billion. Uh, in, in revenues, so it is, it is quite a big jump. So for years to come, if China got more and more access to the internet and more people are kind of owning um, smartphones or consoles and things like that, we can see the growth uh, growing even more higher. So why is it doing so well? Well, if you look at um, all the graphs that we've shown so far, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that two-thirds of the world of people are, um, are, are gamers. Uh, that's what the numbers are telling us. Why? Um, because of phones. Uh, I've got one out of my pocket here. Ta -da. So everyone has one of these, I'm sure, by now. Uh, otherwise, you're very old school. Um, so I think back about 10 years ago, um, Apple kind of changed the way that the, uh, the, the kind of mobile industry was going. 
Um, it was the first time that everyone saw a touch screen. Uh, everything can be t you know, done at a tap of finger. Uh, you can watch your favorite shows. Uh, you can stream your uh, favorite YouTubers. Uh, vote on your favorite posts and of course you know with us ladies uh, all, all guys as well uh, like to use the uh, filters to look us uh, look uh, great so why is that because everything can be done so conveniently you can take it on the go so that goes for the same for games and um, if you look at what's available in the app store there's the percentage of um, games versus uh, apps for other things um, is actually kind of outweighs everything about kind of like 26% um, which is quite significant considering all the other apps are um, break down into many many other small forms like um, uh, and like a photo app or if you want to do something with documents and stuff like that so um, yeah so if you were to look at okay just let's like look at the um, device and how it's like kind of spread per um, um, ac across the world. Like, um, how is it broken down? Um, you see that about 51% of it is actually mobile. Now, uh, on this graph, it, it does include tablet as well, but it's considered kind of the same. Um, and then you have a quarter making up for consoles, and the other quarter making up for PC. Um, and as stated earlier, it was all about the kind of convenience of playing and playing games. You have, you know, 300 pinning people around the world owning smartphone devices. Um, and yeah, <laughs> so it's big uh, and it will grow even more in the future. So when you have um, kind of loads of games available, it also means a wider audience, and wider audience also brings in like more diversity of uh, things to come. Um, you, you know, your typical gamer is no longer a, a child or a, a teen in their bedrooms playing. Um, you now have mums, you know, going shopping and collecting leaf tickets from Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, or businessmen um, hatching Pokemon eggs as they are um, doing their kind of walk to work. Um, so it's like the the market now is that there's a um, there's a game for everyone, and this is an example of all the top um, kind of the more successful uh, campaigns and bundles that we've done in Habo. Um, I remember when I first started that uh, when I was speaking to my art director at the time, uh, Jeffrey Staney, um, he was explaining to me that when he was hiring a team. He was looking to kind of increase um, uh, the kind of the balance, kind of balance off the team to give a more um, a balanced team of females and, and, and males. At the time, it was very male dominated, um, but our audience at 13 plus, they really like all these sort of like more cutesy, uh, more feminine things. Um, and so when uh, I was hired along with Kelly, um, the idea was to bring in a little bit more um, kind of choices for habos um, and uh, yeah so kind of like what I was saying before when you when there's a need for more um, more choices in games uh, it's good to also have um, a team that's made up of many different people from many different backgrounds um, these names that you see here are all our in-game names uh, I'm Fuku Yip and Kelly is um, elementary cage. <laughs> um, these are these are pictures that we drew in a recent blog for a, a Bohemian festival kind of campaign. Uh, James was kind of left out in that one, so I kind of included um, a previous picture that he did for Easter. Um, this is our whole team. So there is in total, let's see, four, five, six, six people, two males and. <sighs> four females. We've got a fifth one coming in very soon as well. Um, this guy um, is uh, the mysterious guy. If, if you don't keep up with the blogs, you wouldn't know who he is, but uh, he's been in Habbo for a very, very long time and uh, he's he, it's not with us in London, but he is with us in uh, Helsinki in Finland. 
and uh, we keep communications um, you know from time to time to kind of keep the whole team together and he's in the know-how with um, what's going on in both teams. So how did I end up in games? Well, uh, seven years ago, uh, I was much like you guys. Uh, I was kind of going to graduate or like um, finding my first job. Uh, and I actually, I, I studied uh, uh, animation here in Portsmouth. So I'm an ex-student and um, I'm very jealous of all the kind of big rooms and tech that we have now got that we never got back then. Um, so, so what did I do? Well, I was I, I knew that when I wanted to seek for a job, I wanted two things. Uh, uh, a, I wanted the job to be kind of full of creativity, and uh, secondly, I wanted uh, the ability to draw. Those were my two main passions. Um, I, I would take anything and everything that can come at me, um, or much like most other <laughs> students out there. So, um, yeah, so I applied for many things. I applied for um, animation studios, uh, film production studios, uh, marketing graphic companies, and, uh, of course, games companies. And um, for, for those of you out there who kind of spruced up their portfolio, bought their smart shirts, get re getting ready for interviews, and the ones full of, like, ambition and fire, um, the reality is this is going to be very, very quiet for a very, very long time. Um, and it's okay. Um, the, the person behind the company email inbox is not dead. Um, <laughs> they have read your submission. Um, but sometimes it's due to resources or time management. They can't always get back to you. So it's nothing uh, personal towards uh, all, all your submissions and applications. So, so yeah, so it's been like that for a few months, and then uh, I got a call from Salake, and um, I would, everyone would like to think for themselves that, oh yeah, finally my work has kind of shown through, and, and they, they saw the greatness of my work, and it's all down to me. Uh, partly, partly, but I would also say it's the power of networking. Um, I was lucky enough to get that call because of my two work colleagues and friends from uni. It's just Kelly and the other one is uh, Caroline. They started the pave the way and then I was able to luckily kind of sneak through the back door. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's really important to network with people that you um, respect and you trust and you think, you know, like, oh, you know, he's, he's a good guy because then you can recommend them to other people and... Um, yeah, get in that way. <laughs> um, so then what happened next? Well, I remember going in for my first day. I was really nervous. Uh, I come from an animation background. So being in a games company, I was kind of like, oh no, like I know how to play games, but I don't know how to make games. Uh, I thought I was a bit of an imposter and I'll get found out uh, on the first day, <laughs> uh, not knowing what I'm supposed to do. Um, luckily, I had a really great team. Um, my art director at the time, he, uh, he spent a lot of time and, and, and energy to kind of train me up and um, yeah, and then not long after I was able to kind of increase my skills, increase my knowledge and um, here I am today. Um, so what is it like? Um, well, we have three main uh, offices around the world, one's in UK, in London, uh, the main HQ is in Finland, and then you have uh, well, uh, Spain, um, who is uh, our third office, and, and they're kind of broken down into these little parts here. So there's the campaigns and monetization team, which is I'm, I'm part of, and um, that's mostly the London team. You have user care and safety, um, so they are like our front end uh, of... Uh, dealing with customers, so anyone who's got like tickets or um, questions, and they kind of deal with that. They also help localize uh, a lot of the um, um, the kind of written side of marketing that we have as well to communicate to uh, users. 
We also have uh, our support team and then the devs uh, we share with our sister game Hideaway. And um, yeah, I would say it's really great working with uh, the company that I am with now because they are really open with um, uh, like ideas and suggestions. Um, there's not, there is a hierarchy system, but the, there isn't as well. Um, for example, I'm able to express um, like kind of what I think would sell well for the um, next month. Um, we well, I, a part of my role is that I, I sit in on sales calls every week, and we look at the numbers and we go, okay, what work and what doesn't work, and I relay this to the team. Uh, the team also goes through uh, monthly campaign reviews, so we can look at a bigger picture. Is that campaign doing well? Um, if it is, then we can kind of keep on improving things that does work and things that don't work. We don't just ditch. We also look at how to improve it uh, before we do finally ditch it, perhaps. Um, so I would say that uh, it's really good to be in a... Um, it's, not, it's not a triple-A company. Or we would like to think we are, but it's, it's more of a medium-sized company, I would say. And um, it allows you to be a little bit more hands-on with the work. Uh, for example, um, I don't just sit and do art all day, um, kind of do, but that's just a small part of it. So we take everything from the beginning to the end. So um, we would uh, research ideas for the next campaign that's coming up. We would then um, sketch them up, uh, present them, that gets approved, uh, and then the actual production starts happening. And then once that's finished, we kind of build it in our own in-house editors, and then we upload to the game, we test them, and then we release them. So it's all these steps uh, we, we all do. And um, say if I were to work in a AAA company, I might be, it might be more kind of like a specialized task. So they might ask you as a, as a new junior to create some dust particle effects, for example, and you might be spending months and months doing this dust particles. Um, uh, but, but in the end, it might be the best dust particles that you will see in the next gen games, right? So uh, you've got to kind of think about, uh, think about the pros and cons of that. Uh, so yeah, so when I got in on the first day, what did they get me to do? Badges. Uh, <laughs> at first I was like, oh man, like I really want to make in-game stuff, but you know, you got to start somewhere. And uh, badges is just as important as um, the furniture that we make in the game. Um, Habos love it. They, it's a kind of collector's mentality. So if you can see here, these are the kind of starting badges uh, that I've made and my first furnies which were literal blocks, um, <laughs> and uh, then we moved on. This is kind of more in the more recent year or two. Um, that's the level of my pixel art now. So I'm pretty proud of it, so yeah. <laughs> um, so why is it good? Well, it's great working in a games company because everyone who works there have the main kind of mindset as you. Um, in my team, there's a lot of like likes and dislikes and different tastes. Um, but you know what's great is is that we all kind of know or share similar things that we like, like movies and games. And so when we're kind of communicating to each other, we know exactly what we mean with each other. So, for example, um, in a really old kind of campaign that we did maybe a year or two ago, it was a Santorini Greek campaign, and we were looking at um, kind of building styles and then James goes oh there's this um there's a scene in um Overwatch uh, that's really good for us to look at let's, let's put it in the mood board and I was like Overwatch I don't, I don't really know much about it what is it about and he's like oh well, basically it's like Team Fortress but like cooler and I was like ah okay I get you I get you um uh, of course like there are some exceptions so I don't know if anyone's watched the latest uh, Death Stranding trailer um even with Hideo Kojima's explanation of a stranding game, we are still very confused about what that is. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, and then I've, it feels great. It's been about five and a half years since I joined the company. Uh, everyone feels like one big family. Um, yeah, so it's very enjoyable. So, I hope I inspired you to kind of play games <laughs> and join games. Um, so what are the job opportunities? Um, do you need to be in a games course to be in the games industry? Um, that is a yes and no answer. So it's yes because it's, um, well, yeah, because because you're, you're learning much about the processes uh, from beginning to end on how games are made, but no because um, actually in our team, not many of us actually come from a games background. A majority of us are animators, um, we do animation. Um, uh, also in the hideaway team, uh, there are people who study fashion design. So really what companies are looking for is just um, you know, your strengths and your skills into filling um, niche gaps or weaknesses that could help bolster the game even more. Um, much of the processes is um, kind of different for each games company. Um, so really you would learn on the job uh, how, to, uh, how to make games. Um, what you do need though, whether you're doing 2D or 3D, um, you do need to know the fundamentals of art. So I've listed a whole few things here. So that's um, perception of shape, composition, lighting, shadows, edges, positive and negative spaces, relationship between colors, depth and volume, and etc. etc. There's there's a lot more to it. But um, once you have these fundamentals, um, it can the skills can be easily transferred. Um, when the art director is telling you about composition, then you go, oh yeah, I know what that is, and then kind of move things to look a little bit more correct. Um, so really drill down on the fundamentals. All right, on to job application advice. Uh, so as part of design lead, I'm also looking after or have the responsibility of uh, hiring future um, juniors into the team. So in the past year and a half, I think I've seen over about 700 different applicants. Um, and um, it is really an eye opener. Um, I would say that in terms of things like forgetting to attach your portfolio or putting missing web links um, is very, very common. And um, it's not just one or two or even a dozen, it's like over a hundred. And it really surprised me because I'm like, I really want to hire you, but I just can't see your work. <laughs> so um, those are very kind of like um, basic things and I'm guessing you not haven't just sat here just to listen to that. So I'm going to go through a little bit more um, kind of unusual or unique things that I found that you might not have thought of. So the first one is, Every company can have their own diff uh, um, HR recruitment system and they can be different. Um, my company uses uh, something called Bamboo HR and this is what I see. I see a page and then I see uh, everyone's portfolios kind of uh, and CVs attached to it. Um, oh, I think one of my, <laughs> uh, that's a good example. Uh, there is a bad example on the left side. This one's the good one. Um, so on the left and the bad example is I think someone decided I'm an illustrator and I really want to show off uh, my art skills. So they decided to, I think, export um, their whole CV out as a picture. Unfortunately, our system didn't really know how to handle that and then kind of just gave us a little, <laughs> a little snapshot of what that is. Um, whereas on the right side, uh, I called him Bob. Bobkins, because I couldn't think of any other good name, but um, <laughs> um, he's doing the right job. So he, you can see everything's laid out neatly. My tools are up there, so if I can, I zoom in if I want to, download it if I want to. Um, so just be wary of um, sizes and format. I would say PDF is the safest choice because it's universal. As for sizes, um, I. You need to do your research, <laughs> see which sizes kind of fit the best. 
All right, stats bars. I don't know why this is really popular because it's bad. Well, I'm not, I wouldn't say it's bad, but it doesn't really mean anything to me. Um, so this is an example that I just kind of Googled up. Um, someone decided I'm going to list all the skills that I have and I'm going to put like a, like a gauge of uh, how good it is. Um, but I don't know what those are, like what units are they in? Um, like what, 15 out of 16, what, like effort points or something? Um, so I would try and avoid that. It might look kind of cool and kind of fills up the page, but uh, to me it's a little bit useless because I don't really know to, in relative, like what does that actually mean in skills. Um, and in some cases actually could make your skills look worse than it actually is. So maybe you're pretty good at photography, but because you've just um, compared it to everything else that you're better in, it's kind of like kind of made you look like a really bad photographer. <laughs> so yeah, I would try to avoid that. Um, next point is put your best work, uh, but also your sketches, your pre-production and developments. I've seen so many people just put maybe five of their best rendered uh, pictures, and I'm like, oh, that's great, um, but you know, you can spend days, months just perfecting this one picture. It doesn't really tell me much about your thought processes or um, how it came about to get you to that point. So what I would love to see is more sketches, um, more development work so that I know that you didn't just go for the straight thing, like the first thing that kind of came to your head. I know that you thought about what works and what doesn't. Um, don't fake it till you make it, fake it till you become it. <laughs> so um, this is more of a kind of confidence tip. Uh, I remember that when I first graduated, going into the first interview, uh, I was very, very nervous, um, shaky, and um, uh, I kind of didn't really know what to do. And I thought I came, I walked away kind of um, thinking that I didn't go so well. Um, but it, I did okay, but just so that you can have some advice before you kind of go off. Um, my tip, my personal tip that I think works for me is just act it out. So don't think you're you going into the uh, interview room. Think of yourself as, uh, I'm gonna act as someone else and put on a different persona. And I know it's easier said than done, but um, you just need to kind of put on a mask and then just pretend that you're not you. <laughs> uh, kind of channel in someone that you feel is confident. It could be, I don't know, um, Daenerys Stormborn, uh, Mother of Dragons, you know, she's a pretty confident person. Just feel like you're doing this for someone else, like you're that friend that um, you want uh, to help get a job. Um, so I don't know if that would work for you guys as well, but it certainly worked for me. Um, be genuine and be yourself. Uh, clear answers that show conviction and integrity to your own views and values. Um, I've seen so many people that come in uh, who are, when you when you get to the interview level, you must think that um, you know you, at that point you need to think that you're actually halfway there. Of all the hundreds of people uh, of, of different CVs that the recruiter has been looking at, they've picked you, and they won't pick that many people to go into the office uh, to view. So actually. Um, you've already got that substance in there from your skills that you've shown in your portfolios and uh, your CV and experiences. Once you're there, it really is kind of like a, a personality test. They want to see if you can mix in well with the team. They want to see how you think, um, how you tackle problems. Um, so you shouldn't really need to feel like um, that you have to answer because you think it's correct. Um, just, just be yourself. I had a, I had a girl who came in not long ago, um, just to use this example. I asked her a few questions, and uh, there was very, there was kind of a variety of answers that you can give uh, to the questions that I asked. But she kind of used all of them. So when I asked her, um, okay, so you know, artists they they often uh, hit a creator's block. What would you do to um, you know, get over that. What do you like to do? I want to know more about her. Um, and she couldn't really think 
like that much so I was helping her and I was like okay would you I don't know uh, research more like look on Pinterest get some inspiration online um, you know take out um, and, I mean take a break and go out and um, kind of calm yourself and free your mind and she goes yes 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 to all of that so really it didn't really answer my question um, so yeah so it is important to kind of <sighs> Give a little bit of yourself to the company and go, look, this is who I am. This is why I'm different. Because if you're answering the same questions as everybody else, um, you know, I'm left thinking, okay, well, is that really, uh, you know, is that person uh, really who they say they are? And why would I want more of the same? I would want, want of our kind of um, uh, more choices of people rather and kind of go back to the idea of diversity. Um, you know, that's what it's all about. So don't be afraid to be yourself. Um, yeah, so that covers all my parts. Thank you. <laughs>